So what are some other meats that you recommend that we should be eating? Meat is, I'm sorry, foods that you recommend foods. we should be eating, yeah. I think then the next best would be tubers, like roots, mm -hmm. sweet potato, rutabaga, parsnip, turnips, etc. cetera. Um, because they are, they're generally fairly low carb. Um, sweet potatoes are? Sweet potatoes are a little bit higher in carbs. They're, yeah. they're way less than, than grains. Uh -huh. But a lot of these, uh, like the rutabaga and so forth, they're, they're fairly low carb. Sure, gotcha. Uh, and they're also gluten-free, and they pretty much fit into any regimen. So if you're, if you're on an autoimmune diet, if you're on a lectin-free diet, if you're avoiding nightshades, the, the tubers are still safe. Mm -hmm. What are the top tubers? Sweet potatoes? Uh, s sweet potatoes, potatoes, mm -hmm. rutabaga, uh, turnips, parsnips. Uh, what's the other one? The celery root. Okay. So those are generally pretty good. And again, if so the, the sweet potato is generally more safe than the potato because the potato is a nightshade. Mm -hmm. So if you, again, have those sensitivities and you're avoiding nightshades, then potato has to go as well. Okay, so we got the tubers. What's the next category you really like? So then, assuming that you're not sensitive to nightshades, then I would go with all of the non-starchy vegetables. So now we got eggplants and bell peppers that, that I think for most people are good foods, but again, they, are, they have some lectins. Mm -hmm. Then I think the broccoli and cauliflower are like staples uh, in, in my house for sure. That you those can- are low, Those are low, I mean, those are like very low calorie. Yes. Nutrient dense, but also low carb too, right? I mean, they're yes. Very, yeah, I mean. Broccoli, uh, cauliflower, they're like four or five percent net carbs. So it's gotcha. very, very low. Yeah. And of course, avocado, mm -hmm. which is really a fruit by, by definition, but it has quite a bit of fat and very, very low carbs. It's like mm -hmm. two, three percent really? net carbs. Okay. And what's the deal with the nightshades? Because I know there's a big... Uh, um, you know, conversation about that right now where these, these foods actually are hurting you, you know, these nightshades, or it depends on your sensitivity level. Correct. Right? They're hurting some people. The plant paradox, right? Yeah. Correct. Yes. So then I don't know what the percentage would be, but I would not, I think gluten hurts everyone, mm. right? But I don't think lectins hurt everyone, not at those doses. Again, it's, it's all about smaller doses, dosage. Right? So nightshades have lectins, and if you are sensitive to something, if you have inflammation, if you have some issues, then I think sort of like the, the carnivore. You do, carnivore is more extreme, but before that, you want to try cutting out the lectins, cutting out the, the nightshades. Mm -hmm. Okay. But again, it's not... Some people sort of pick their little niche and, and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the lectin guy, I'm going to be the nightshade guy. And they, they promote that as the solution for everyone, but it, it's not. Yeah. And, and low carb is not the solution for everyone. I have some skinny patients that need to eat carbs, carbs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? They don't need to eat sugar and white bread, but they, they would probably do better eating 70, 80, 100 grams of carbs. Because mm -hmm. they're yeah. very, very insulin sensitive. Their body has trouble putting on some weight. Right. Are there any other categories you think we should be eating? The, the leafy greens are kind of mm -hmm. in the, the non-starchy vegetables, but they're, they're sort of a little subcategory. And then I think uh, some people can account the the eggs with, mm -hmm. with the meat, but I, yeah. I think it's a separate category because very few people are sensitive to meat. A lot of people are sensitive to eggs. People are sensitive yes. to eggs. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and again, it's not a majority. It's not, mm -hmm. like, not like with wheat or, or pasteurized milk, but I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20%. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's hard to tell because the people that come 
to my clinic, they're the ones who have the problems. Mm -hmm. So they're probably way more sensitive than, than the general population. Sure. Are you a big fan of eggs yourself? Yes. As a food group? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think quality is huge. I think a lot of problems develop because people eat really, really poor quality. Mm. So I think if the, if the chicken or the hen had a healthy life and produces a healthy egg, I think you're much less likely to ever develop a sensitivity. Mm -hmm. But if that chicken is eating chemicals and hormones and was raised under horrendous conditions, I, I think your body is much more likely to develop a sensitivity to that because of whatever might be in there. Right, right. Any other final category you like as a food group? As the, the most nutrient-dense foods. Yeah, I do think even though dairy is a very common allergen, I do think a lot of people do well with some forms of dairy. So I typically recommend yogurt mm -hmm. and sour cream mm -hmm. because it's very rewarding. If you're doing a low carb diet, then adding a little sour cream to something is, is super tasty. Mm -hmm. I think cheese is okay for a lot of people, especially if it's like a good quality cheese, not the, the melty singles right. and all that. But not the nacho cheese dip at yeah. the movie theater, which tastes so good, but it's not that good for yeah, you. Yeah, I don't even know about that. <laughs> it's not even cheese, yeah, right? Yeah, I think I've trained myself into just associating chemicals with, I know. with that stuff. I know. But yeah, I, I try to get things as close to nature as possible. So mm -hmm. if I have the option, I'm going to get pasture-raised eggs. I'm going to get raw cheese with as few additives mm -hmm. as possible. Because okay. nature made things for us. We, we are nature, right? And all the other animals on the planet, they graze off the planet. They don't process things. They don't alter things. So as soon as we change it, we increase the likelihood of screwing it up. Mm -hmm. And the more we change it, the more we screw it up. So right. the closer we can get to, to the source, the, the better. Yeah. What would be three foods that you would recommend everyone eliminate? If you could eliminate or have very, very little every once in a while, but if you could almost eliminate these three foods from your mm -hmm. diet, it would help you in a big way. So I don't know if we can call them foods, okay. <laughs> but obviously sugar. Uh-huh. Uh, sugar in the quantity, refined sugar in, in the quantities we eat is, is absolutely toxic to the body. Number two would be processed fats. So healthy fats are natural fats, butter, meat fat, pork, avocado, olive oil, etc. Because we don't change them, we don't mm -hmm. mess with them. But anything that we make an oil from that doesn't, necess that doesn't come easily, like a seed or corn. Corn has just a couple of percent fat in it. So it takes a lot of heat and chemicals and processing to get any oil out of it. So mm. it tastes terrible. And then you have to bleach it and deodorize it and, and all that. So it, it's not a food anymore. And, and those foods are extremely toxic. So mm. soybean oil corn oil, canola oil, all of those processed oils, and especially if they're turned into a food product like margarine or shortening or something like that. Okay. So I put, I'd say sugar and, and seed oils. And then something, again, that's not really a food, but I would, I would put it up there. And every time I make a video on this, I get a lot of backlash. And it's artificial sweeteners. Oh, man. Why are, and, there, why are artificial sweeteners and people, not good for us? Because they are chemicals. Mm -hmm. They're foreign substances. They were developed by companies who made pesticides. And, and the latest and greatest, so, so aspartame got a bad rap, so then they had to hustle to come up with something else, so they came up with sucralose. And they were very careful to name it in a way that like sounded, sugar. yes, sucrose, sugar, sucralose. But the fact is, and, and, then, and then they said that, well, you know, it's just like sugar. And then it 
just has some chlorine, just like oh. sea salt. Well, in nature, sodium chloride is only bonded through like an electrostatic charge. I forget exactly what it's called, but it's not like a tight bond. So yes, sodium chloride, perfectly natural. But when we bind chlorine to a carbon, nature never does that. Basically, every form of a chlorocarbon is a pesticide. And one of the most famous ones was DDT, which was banned as a cancer-causing agent. It almost wiped out the national bird, wow. <laughs> the eagle. And it's so toxic, it's in our environment 50 years later. So chlorocarbons are pesticides, and that's what sucralose is. It's mm -hmm. a chlorocarbon. Wow. So eliminate refined sugar, eliminate processed fats, which is mostly seed oils and artificial sweeteners. Are yeah. there any non-sugar sweeteners, yes. natural, yes. that you like or recommend that in the right doses are okay for you? Yes. So I use quite a bit of stevia. Uh -huh. That's and not an artificial sweetener, or it is? No, no. So some people bundle it together with artificial sweeteners just because it's a non-calorie sweetener. But it is a plant product. It's just a refined leaf, basically. Mm -hmm. And the thing to watch for, though, is that they don't mix it up with a lot of other chemicals, that it's sure. the, the concentrated version. It's one ingredient, not Correct. 10 ingredients. Yeah. yeah. And, and another similar one would be monk fruit. Uh -huh. That is also very similar in the, in the way it tastes and, and looks and so forth. It's super, super concentrated. Uh, and it's also a, a plant extract. So if you're going to add something to a coffee or a drink or something, Correct. stevia, monk fruit, you yeah. say is, is okay in the right doses. Yes. Okay. And then in the gray zone, I would also put sugar alcohols. Interesting. Right? Okay. Uh, some of them are better than others. I think the best one would be erythritol because it is very slightly metabolized by the body. So it doesn't really affect blood sugar, but it doesn't really cause any other problems. Some of the other sugar alcohols, they sort of stay in the digestive tract for a while, and then those sugar alcohols become food for your mm. intestinal bacteria, and that's where you get a lot of bloating. Gotcha. So I would say sugar alcohols are okay if you eat them in moderation. So this, this is always the, the trick in recommending food. When you, you make a list and people want to know the best one and yeah. the, so forth, and you, you categorize it and rank them, and now they say, that is a good one, I'm just going to eat that. Or Dr. Eckberg said sugar alcohols are okay, so now I'm going to eat that every day. I'm going to bake with it, I'm going to buy the ice cream with it. And, and, and that's the thing, everything in, in moderation. So sugar alcohols, if you eat a teaspoon or a tablespoon here and there, I think it's totally fine. But if you start baking with it and doing the ice cream and you start getting half a cup a day, now you're definitely going to upset the, mm -hmm. the biome a little bit. Now, what matters based on your age range? You know, if someone's in their 20s versus I'm in my late 30s, almost 40, you're in your, I believe, 50s, you said. Yeah. Does it matter yeah. based on how old you are of what you should be eating, uh, how much you should be eating? types of foods, or is it pretty consistent throughout the decades? I, I would say it's pretty consistent throughout. And one, one analogy would be that, I mean, there's so many people, they say that women should fast this way, and teenagers should fast this way, and women over 40 or under 47. It's like we love to complicate right. things, <laughs> right? But are there different foods on the savanna for one giraffe versus another? <laughs> An older giraffe and a younger yeah. giraffe. Does, yeah. the, does the male and the female giraffe eat from different trees? Mm. It's like, not really. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that there's no value to that, but I think we tend to overcomplicate things. I think we, if, if we 
Just understand that it's like 99% the same. And then that last percent is where if we want to really pick it apart, then there may be some benefit there. Mm -hmm. If you go year in and year out and feed your body sugar or, or carbohydrates every two hours, your body is going to upregulate all of the pathways to deal with carbohydrates. It's going to downregulate any pathway to pull from fat. So now 